Good morning. We are here to interview Dr. Shlomo Newman from the University of Arizona for the time capsules of the International Association of Hydrogeologists. And interviewing will be Alberto Guadagnini to my right from the Politecnico de Milano. Later on, Daniel Tartakovsky from the University of California at San Diego will join us. And myself, I am Jesus Carrera from CSIC in Spain. And um, Alberto, why don't you start? Thank you, Jesus. Shlomo, I was extremely touched and moved after reading your recent autobiography in Groundwater. And uh, I would like you to go over your early years of your infancy for us. So if so you can say a few words about uh, the place where you were born, the memories that you have about the place, uh, how often you go there. <laughs> Well, I was uh, born in uh, a town called Zilina in Slovakia uh, in uh, October 1938, um, just about a month after the Munich Agreement that essentially dismantled the state of Czechoslovakia in which I was born and turned it into two states. Uh, the Czech Republic, which was under Nazi occupation, and uh, Slovakia, which became autonomous but affiliated with uh, Hitler's regime. Uh, so I actually was born almost to an occupied, not really occupied, but Nazi allied country. And as when I was a little kid, uh, the newly established state of Slovakia uh, brought in all kinds of injunctions against the Jews. Uh, the details are uh, described in, in my autobiography, so I will not go into all of these details. But essentially what has happened is that when I was about uh, four years old, we literally had to flee for our life. Uh, so we uh, crossed the border into Hungary illegally at night um, and we stayed in Hungary until the almost the end or the beginning, frankly, I'm not remember, of, of uh, 43 or 44. Okay, so I was born in 38 and, and this was uh, 44, so I spent uh, 1943 in Hungary illegally where I had to learn the Hungarian language. I was not allowed to speak Slovak because they would have known that we are illegal immigrants. Um, but toward the end of 43, beginning of 44, things became very hot for us in Hungary. And so we repeated the process. We, we went back uh, again illegally, crossed the border with a guide on foot uh, to Slovakia. And so, yes. during this time, did you play with other kids in the streets in Hungary? Did you speak Hungarian? Well, in Hungary, I was actually in a kindergarten. Uh, within the first two weeks, I was kept indoors until my Hungarian was good <laughs> enough so that I could uh, not freely, but at least communicate with, with kids. Um, and so within a month, you know, I, I actually had kids around me. So that I don't think was a problem, though if you had a chance to talk to my parents, maybe they would give you a different picture. Uh, my memories, of course, from those years are very, very vague. Uh, but I do remember that after we came back we, to Slovakia, we lived in a small village called Czechlis, very close to the main city of Slovakia, was the capital, Bratislava, uh, very close to Vienna. And uh, there we lived in what I think was a doctor's house. Now, who this doctor was and what happened to them, I have no idea. But we uh, pretended to be Christians. We uh, had a Christian name. Our last name was Modosh. My first name was Peter. I was born Peter. Shlomo did not exist yet on the map. I remember about Peter, the story about how I came to know that the Shlomo P. Newman was Peter Newman. Peter. Because I always thought about you as Shlomo P. Newman. Yeah. Well, I can tell you later the story of you know, how I came up to, to, to get the name Shlomo. But uh, at that time I was Peter, and when we came back, we were Peter Modosh because we came from Hungary, and uh, that was a you know, Christian name. 
Um, I was running around with the kids, the urchins of, of the village. I did not have any problems. I had a lot of friends there who, of course, didn't know that I don't belong, really. Uh, my parents uh, worked, went to work every day in the nearby big city of Bratislava. I don't know how they found jobs and what they were doing, but they were working. Uh, and we went this way until uh, Christmas of 1944. Do you want me to tell you the story of what happened in I Christmas? I would like to, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but one thing, at that time, were you aware that you were in danger? As, As a, a kid. kid, I probably was vaguely aware. <laughs> and you know, kids, my biggest problem was that every time when we moved this way, I had to leave all of my toys and especially my bear behind, my, my teddy bear. So those were my most traumatic um, experiences of those years, plus the crossing of the border because we were, you know, we, you're crossing through searchlight, searchlights and dogs and so on, barking at night. So that, that was, in fact, I have that picture, me being on my father's shoulders, crossing illegally, very, very carefully, uh, the border into Hungary. I don't remember so much the, the back trip. But anyway, so just coming back to uh, Christmas 1944, this is uh, December 1944, since we were pretending to be Christians, we had of course a Christmas tree and I had my socks outside hanging, you know, filled with chocolates and so on. And uh, suddenly there is this, n I, in fact I remember what I was doing, I was in the process of polishing my parents' shoes as there was this knock on the door <coughs> and we saw, I believe there were two uh, men with long, heavy leather trench coaches, uh, coats. And uh, later on, of course, I learned at that point, I was just kind of scared a little bit to see these men, but didn't know who they were. But later it became clear that these were the Slovak secret police who came to essentially arrest us. Uh, they took us to a jail in Bratislava. I remember being separated from my father, me and my mother were with a bunch of ladies in a cellar cell. There must have been about six or seven beds, one next to the other. Essentially the whole room, the whole, whole place was just beds. And we were there about a week. Uh, years later, I learned from my mother after the war that in fact someone who knew them from our town of Zilina, where I was born, was apparently collaborating with the Nazis and, and recognized my parents going off the train or on the train, and uh, he squealed on us, and this is, this is what happened. And that was the last time you saw your father? No. Uh, then, we, uh, after, after this one week, and again, after the war, my mother told me horror stories about what she had to do during this week, because she knew many languages, so they used her as a translator in interrogations upstairs. I didn't know anything about it at the time. Um, but um, my mother and these women, and there might have been other kids, were taken to a nearby, uh, some people refer to it as a labor camp, I refer to it as a transition camp called Sered, where they had these barracks. And uh, in fact, you probably saw those barracks yesterday in my slideshow. Yes. I remember yeah. those, that, that picture from the slideshow is exactly how I remember that place. Uh, we were there maybe for a week. Uh, during that time, my father volunteered to carry coal in a little wheelbarrow from one barrack to another so that he could stop by our barrack. And that was the last time that I saw him. Actually, I remember I was standing outside. He and my mother were inside talking, and that was the last time I saw him. I see. And right after the war, then, you moved to Israel. Well, actually, if, if you want to follow this a little chronologically, this was not the end of the war, because now, you see, my, we were separated from my father. Uh, it was the last time I saw him, but my mother and I actually uh, were uh, taken together with many other Primarily women and children. Now, there might have been men elsewhere, which I, I haven't seen, but we, we were packed into uh, freight trains. We were packed into this particular train carriage, completely closed. You know, we, were, we couldn't get out or anything. And we traveled for about a week in, in those conditions. Very, very 
unpleasant conditions, as you can imagine, traveled uh, to a concentration camp north of Prague in occupied Czech. It now it's the Czech Republic. At that time, it was just occupied Czechoslovakia, called Terezin. Some people refer to it as Terezinstadt. That was an old uh, army barracks established by the Austrian Queen Maria Theresa, um, maybe 100 or 150 years earlier, which the Germans have turned into a concentration camp, among others. <coughs> the camp had a prison called the Small Fortress, in which the person who had was the direct cause for World War I, one of the people who has, or the person who has assassinated the Archduke, uh, the Austrian Archduke, which started World War I, died there of uh, tuberculosis, I understood, in uh, 1918, of course, before we came there. But so, so this, was, this was the circumstance. And how long did you stay there? We stayed there. So we got there about January, early January of 1944. Uh, luckily, 44 or 45? 45. Thank you. 45 uh, indeed. Terezin, I'm surprised because I thought Terezin was only for Jews from Moravia and Bohemia. Well, not really. Not really. It, it, they, they brought Jews also from Germany there. Until we arrived, virtually everybody who spent some time in Theresienstadt, or Terezin as I will refer to it, was eventually moved elsewhere, primarily to Auschwitz, which uh, most of them didn't, didn't come back. So we were extremely lucky because the Germans have stopped these transport out of Terezin exactly two weeks before we arrived. So rather than being on the move to Auschwitz, where we probably would have perished, uh, we got stuck in Terezin, which was a, a good thing for us. Uh, my mother was put in charge of a children's group, and I was again extremely lucky to be in her children's group. It was a special children's house. The German used this particular camp as a showcase. They would invite representatives of the Red Cross to see you, see how well we treat the Jews. Uh, they would allow them to give us chocolates and, and milk and so on. So because of that, and because they have already, under the pressure of the advancing Russian army from the east, stopped these transport to Auschwitz, we were saved. Uh, we stayed there until May of 45, when the Red Army, actually a Czech unit of the Red Army, occupied, you know, as they were moving west toward Berlin, they occupied uh, the, the area of Prague and Terezin. And uh, so I didn't understand what was happening, but in the morning I go out and I see everybody milling outside with Czech flags on their lapel. I have no idea how they got these little Czech plaques. Probably the army gave it to them, you know, the Czech unit of the army. And I was asking my mother what is going on, and she said, we are free. I see. You know, now in the Jewish Museum of Prague, they have drawings of kids in tourism. Yes. Next time I go, I'll check and see if there is some drawing from Shlomo Peter Newman. There is no drawing from Shlomo Peter Newman. Most of these drawings are from the kids who actually went it's, it's interesting that you're bringing it up. There is a book, actually, that you can buy on Amazon.com or anywhere else called uh, something about butterflies. The, the exact name escapes me, which has a collection of these drawings. Uh, the fact is that about 15,000 Jewish kids perished you know, on the way to Auschwitz, and about 100 survived. You were mentioning, can we go back to how you got the name of Shlomo, actually? I don't know the story. <laughs> well, that's very funny because after the war, we, get, we came back to, to our um, town of Zilina. I went to school. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of detail there that I, I think we can skip. Uh, but uh, um, in 1949, the State of Israel was established. And so my parents and I decided, my parents, my mother remarried and we had another brother. My uh, parents decided, uh, well together actually, we decided we will be moving to, to, to Israel. And uh, this was also a period when Czechoslovakia was on its way to become communist. 
So we decided we don't, didn't want to stay in Czechoslovakia in the first place, <coughs> and we certainly didn't want to stay under the communist rule. So we, um, we, we decided to go to Israel, and I was sent with a group of children through France, just to make absolutely sure that I get there, even if my parents will, for some reason, not get exit visas from, from the uh, government. And uh, so they arrived in Israel before me because we spent half a year in France with this group of children. You were 11 years old at the time. I was uh, 10 to 11 years old. So yeah. they separated you from your yeah, parents? Yeah. And oh, yeah. And uh, this was very nice, you know, this was a beautiful part of my life. I, I had a great time with these kids and so on in France. Uh, but one of the things that happened there is because they were preparing us for life in Israel, uh, they took us to a, a beautiful camp in the Alps and said, okay, guys, you choose yourself Hebrew names, you're going to Israel, the language spoken there is Hebrew. And throw your old names into the bonfire. Put, the, put them on a piece of paper, throw them into a bonfire, which is what I did. You know, I wrote Peter there. And I remember that uh, my mother told me that my Hebrew name, every Jewish kid when he's born, he, she is born to get a Hebrew name. And so my recollection was that she gave me, or my parents gave me the name of Shlomo, which supposedly was the Hebrew name of my paternal grandfather. But then when we finally arrived in Israel, and I'm being introduced to her as Shlomo, she was horrified. She said, how did you ever? So like, so you told me that, you, that my I'm named after my grandfather. I never said anything of the kind, she said. So that's how I became Shlomo. <laughs> I see, but you decided <coughs> to keep Peter as? Well, I kept Peter as, as, as a second name. It's my official second name. We saw actually a picture of you driving a tractor in a kibbutz. Were you really driving tractors? <laughs> well, yes. I mean, they were you know, this was a farm. In Israel, I lived on a farm. My parents didn't live on Are a farm. Are you telling me that you were really working? Uh, yes, we were working, but I was actually not working on a tractor. However, there was somebody with a camera who decided to take a picture of me with a tractor. <laughs> but yes, we were working. As, as kids, we uh, went to school um, for, I don't know, five, six hours every day. By working, you meet out in the field, you. And after school, we were divided among various jobs that needed to be done. You know, it started with an hour when we were 12 years old, and then it built up to three hours when we were 17, 18 years old. And yes, there were many people who worked, you know, in the chicken coop, with uh, cows in the cow shed, out in, in the fields with vegetables, uh, with uh, fish ponds, whatever. And, and you were also studying at that time? It was a regular school. The, the, the regime was that, you know, in the morning you study, in the afternoon you work, then you come back, you do your homework. And uh, it was communal living. We lived in a dorm. And how did you start your love for geology and hydrogeology? Ah, that came much later. Much, much, much later than much, that? Much, much later. Um, so it does not date back to your working in the field, actually. It actually has absolutely zero <laughs> to do with my work in the field. Uh, after my high school in the kibbutz, I uh, joined the army. At that time, the army, so, you know, everybody had to serve in the army, in the Israeli army. It was uh, a two-and-a-half-year-long uh, year service. Um, when I finished the army, I decided to go to university. <coughs> As a high school kid already, I developed a passion for physics, especially nuclear physics, because when I was a high school kid, uh, there was a lot of talk about the Manhattan Project and, uh, you know, the nuclear bomb and so on. Um, and of course, coming from Europe where uh, the war against the Nazis was won, uh, everybody was extremely happy that it was the West that developed the weapon, not, not uh, Hitler. So, so there was a huge amount of interest in this. And I became interested and in started reading books uh, written for, for high school kids about nuclear physics and so on. So I became very much interested in nuclear physics and I wanted to study physics and mathematics. But, but I didn't have a high school up, diploma because in the kibbutz, the yeah, well, the, the kibbutz did not actually give us high school diploma. The, the high school studies were not geared toward the official government diploma, without which it was impossible to get accepted to university. So I did my high school diploma uh, living with my parents in, uh, in the town called Naria in northern Israel. 
I uh, did my high school uh, diploma by correspondence, took me about a year and a half. And after that, I had to select what I am going to study, what I'm going to apply for. You did this high school diploma after the army? After the army, after the army. So I was actually 22 years old when I became a freshman at the university. Um, the only reason I did not go into physics and mathematics was because I was told by others who did go into this program that in order to make it through the first year, everybody is accepted. There was no problem of acceptance. So at the beginning of the year, you have these lecture rooms crowded with, with students at the end of the year because of things like matrix algebra. You know, just the term scared me. Uh, not more than 10, 15 survive. I said, this is not for me. I'm not such a genius. You have to be a genius in math and physics. So what else can I study? And one day, my stepfather comes home and tells me this story about a friend of his whose son is a geologist. And what does he do? He runs up and down these hills. He was working in Greece somewhere. I'm not sure exactly what he was doing. It was a little hammer and getting $1,000 a month, which at that time was a huge salary. I said, this is what I'm going to study. And this is how I got to geology. <laughs> So that's why you hammer things. Now so that's now. why I hammer <laughs> things to this day, yes. <laughs> so when did you decide, uh, I mean, how come you decided then uh, after graduation to go to Berkeley? Well, actually it's funny because it has something to do with my passion for nuclear physics. Which was totally... Which was totally, totally different. I, I <laughs> well, not abandoned, but I read a lot about Oppenheimer, and Lorentz, the cyclotron, uh, theoretical physics, and so on. The Manhattan Project, of which, of course, Oppenheimer was, was the leader. So Berkeley had this aura in, in many people's eyes, I'm sure, not only mine, as being one of the top schools anywhere, certainly for physics and mathematics, but also you know, for any hard sciences. And I was not entirely satisfied with my choice of geology. I, I like geology very much. I like the field aspect of geology very much. But there was just a little bit too little physics and mathematics in it. So I was searching for something that would allow me to combine what became a, an, an interest in the earth sciences, but not a sufficient interest, with something a little bit more mathematically, physically oriented. So I looked into mining and in fact I almost, I was accepted into the, the master's program in mining at the Israeli Institute of Technology called uh, the Technion in Haifa. I didn't really like the idea very much. Um, and uh, I was searching for something else, geophysics. I was thinking about geophysics, but Israel was a small country and it didn't look like geophysics has future in the country. But at that time, this was in the 1960s, there were major water development projects in the country. And so somehow this caught my interest. I talked to some, a, a very well-known hydrogeologist in Israel, Shmuel Mandel. Uh, I had an interview with him, told him my situation. I uh, told him I, I have decided to study in the United States, but I didn't know, of course, where yet. Uh, what should I study? And he said, well, you know, we need people who can sit on wells, drillers. So I said, okay, <laughs> you know, drilling sounds interesting, but groundwater hydrology, of course, came into the picture. And uh, the groundwater hydrology place, groundwater played a major, major role in the Israeli water projects of, the, of that time, it still does. So I decided I'm going to study something related to groundwater, and I applied to various places. Um, I got a very nice offer from Paul Witherspoon for, for research assistantship in Berkeley. Um, and, and that's it. That's Did you go there for an interview? Uh, there was no interview. No, I was in oh, Israel. So, yeah, I was so in Israel. Was no right. I applied. He was at that time in mining. Mm -hmm. It's mining and mineral technology was called. So, you know, it was related to areas that I was already thinking of studying in Israel, but I realized there's a groundwater component to it, so, so that's what I did. It was not civil engineering. It was not civil engineering. We did move to civil engineering. They reorganized us later. And while I was working on my PhD later, we did switch into civil engineering. We moved physically into the civil engineering building. There was a new building called Davis Building in Berkeley, and we moved into that. So you went to Berkeley. 
And that was by plane or by ship at the time? <laughs> by ship. <laughs> by ship. Huh? By ship. Two weeks of a beautiful journey through the Mediterranean and the Atlantic. Um, five very nice days, uh, just walking around and taking the subway of New York City. This was Christmas, beautiful Christmas. Uh, went to visit my parents' friends in Chicago, and from there I flew to Berkeley. And so in early January of 64, uh, I arrived in Berkeley. So there to meet Paul? Where does Paul Immediately I met Paul. I met some other professors. Uh, this was a s essentially a small group that was dealing with uh, not only groundwater, but uh, Paul actually came out of petroleum engineering, so he still had some lingering interest with petroleum. Um, I can tell you about the project we work on it if you're interested later. Uh, which developed into my master's and my PhD. Um, there was a rock mechanics group there, uh, Dick Goodman, who wrote a very well-known book on uh, geological engineering from a mechan rock mechanics standpoint, was um, one of the key people in that group, a very small group. I'm pretty sure Jesus is going to ask you about the project in a while, but I'm more interested in knowing what you were doing your, during your free time in Berkeley. Well, <laughs> one of the first things, of course, was if orientation. Had, the people had, I met there... If you had free time, of well, course. Well, I, I should tell you that as I came to Berkeley, uh, Paul had two students. Uh, these were his first students because he became a professor at a rather advanced age of, I believe, 40-something. So, because he, he was working in the petroleum industry, uh, if I remember correctly, he was the director of a petroleum research laboratory. Um, so, this was kind of the beginning of his academic career, and he had two students, one of whom was called Alan Fries, and the other one, Ira Javandel. I became his third student, and I remember distinctly him asking Al to take me around and introduce me to the campus, to the computer center, you know, show me around, and so on. So, what did I do? I walked around the campus, got to know people, made a lot of friends very quickly in Berkeley. So during your year in Berkeley, you only wa walked around the campus during your free time? Oh, no, 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 no. I mean, that's that's what I'm talking about. Oh, no. <laughs> we, we traveled to San Francisco. You know, San Francisco is a beautiful city. The Bay Area is very beautiful. Um, I got myself a little car for $150. I don't think it would be easy to do today. Of course, $150 was a lot of money at the time. Uh, it was an old 1950-something Chevrolet, Bel Air. I remember that like today, you know, my own car. <laughs> I was 26 years old, about which uh, 25, I understand, Which I understand you forgot some time on campus in the parking spot. Of the well, that came, that, yeah, that, that happened, but that came much later. Actually, it wasn't that car anymore. Yeah, but you see, I didn't really have so much free time because the first semester was a very difficult semester. I had to take some basic engineering classes, some of which were undergraduate classes, uh, such as uh, statics and dynamics. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, I think that's what it was called, uh, material science, um, introductory mathematical class, mathematics classes, and so on. I came out of geology, which is very little background in these areas. So I found, I found those classes rather demanding, so I spent you know, the first semester doing that, worked very hard, but uh, in the summer I met my future wife. So from that point on, that's what I did in Berkeley. That's very so clear. you met her within six or seven months of her That is correct. I, and actually we were destined to meet because um, I was very early after I arrived uh, invited on almost a regular basis to dine with a family in Berkeley who were not associated with the university, they were living in Berkeley. And one day the lady of the house says, uh, Shlomo, you know, um, there is a young lady coming from, uh, from New York. Uh, her name is Yael. And I think you may be interested in meeting her. Why don't you come on such and such day and I will introduce you. I said, sure, I'll be very happy. It just so happened that about three or four days earlier, I went to, there was a place where there were Israeli dancers. There were many Israeli students there, so we would get together, and um, one of the pastimes was to dance once a week or twice a week. And you dance in a circle sometimes. So here I am dancing in a circle, and I see this, what I consider to be a very beautiful young lady. And... Uh, 
then the dances turned into couple dances, you know, and, and where you exchange couples. So you, so you dance with one, and then you exchange and dance with the others. And when she came into my arms, I said to her in English, now you're mine. And she answered in Hebrew, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> so we came to this dinner together. So one way or another, I think we were designed to meet. So, but that, so that was before you were formally introduced? The, I was not formally introduced to her. I, be, there was really no opportunity to formally introduce us because I came with her to this dinner. Ah, okay. Yes. Good. Well, anyhow, le let us uh, stop about this uh, leisure times and that was the most interesting work, part. Back to work. Okay. What were you doing at work at the time? Did you immediately you mean start in working at the university? Project? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, almost immediately, I was offered by Paul Witherspoon. Well, of course, I knew about it already before. Uh, he uh, asked me to work on a very interesting project that had to do with the storage of natural gas. Uh, in aquifers, and one of the key, in, in major cities, for example, there was a big project in uh, the vicinity of Chicago and various other cities like that, and one of the big issues was, uh, this is a storage question, not natural gas extraction. So natural gas, the idea was to store natural gas in aquifers, literally inject natural gas into an aquifer, and the big question was, Will it leak? And of course it could because there were some cases where gas was discovered in people's um, uh, basements. There were a few disasters as far as I know. So the question was, is there a way to determine hydraulically, because the system was fully saturated with water, to determine hydraulically before gas is injected into an aquifer, uh, whether or not it will leak and to what extent? So it's a question of leakage through cap rocks, uh, which we call today acritards. And uh, Paul had this idea that the best way to do so would be to drill a piezometer into the cap rock, drill an observation well nearby into the aquifer that was intended for natural gas storage, uh, pump a well in the aquifer, not necessarily this one, but another one, conduct a pumping well test in the aquifer, a leaky aquifer test if you wish, but measure drawdowns not only in the aquifer being pumped, but in the overlying cap rock as well, and then look at the ratio between these and try to extract from that information about the leakage properties, really the leakance, if you wish, of the aquitard between the piezometer and the aquifer. And so this ratio idea uh, was investigated by him using one of the very first numerical model, finite difference models, that he took from, I believe, the petroleum industry. I don't know who developed it. He didn't develop it, but he brought it into this project. The project was sponsored by the American Gas Association. And he asked me to run this, this code for him, which I did. And he came up, uh, came up with this set of curves uh, based on various parameters of aquifer properties, aquitard properties, and so on, and asked me to then test the results of this numerical code by building a physical model, a physical analog to this flow system, that would have a steel plate about this thick simulating the aquifer and less conducting material condu forming both the bases and the cap rock. And then, you know, to put um, thermostat, I mean, uh, thermistors in there and a heating element and so on, literally use the analogy between heat flow and groundwater to physically kind of verify the predictions that he obtained using this finite difference code. Now, something very similar was done for the master's thesis of Iraj Javondel, and I was watching Iraj struggle with a similar model to test Hantusch's theory of flow to a partially penetrating well during a pumping test, and I really didn't want to do that at all. 
So I asked Paul if he would mind that rather than building this thermal analog, I would try to develop a mathematical solution to this problem, an analytical solution, on paper. So rather than we, we are talking about this kibbutz guy who just studied geology because he didn't dare to with, uh, deal with matrix algebra and who was spending her, his free time uh, playing the accordion and trying to dance with uh, Jael. And you dare to suggest an analytical solution to the leaky aquifer problem? I dared because I already started thinking about it before and I had some ideas of how to go about it. Uh, I saw some papers by Huntush, since I knew that this was a leaky aquifer problem. I went back to Huntush's papers. And but Huntush never took into account the storage into the aquifer. Huntush had two solutions. One that he published with Jacob. This is the more famous Huntus Jacob leaky aquifer solution, which indeed does not consider storage in the aquitar. Uh, but then he published a little bit later another theory called the modified leaky aquifer theory, where he did consider storage. However, all the leaky aquifer theories were based on uh, measuring drawdowns, if you wish, during a pumping test in the aquifer being pumped. Nobody thought about measuring drawdowns, say, in a caprock in an aquitard above or below. And this was Witherspoon's idea, which he investigated numerically because there was supposedly no analytical solution to this. So he said uh, to me, uh, well, no, th this, this is too difficult. I don't think that this is possible. Uh, I said, well, give me two weeks. And if not, then I'll go and build this thermal analog. Now, frankly, I had no idea if I'll have a solution or not in two weeks, but I did have the solution in two weeks. It was very heavily built on the concepts that underlie the modified leaky aquifer theory of Huntush. And we were able to essentially analytically achieve something which he didn't think would be achievable. And this is one of the beauties of analytical solutions as opposed to blind brute force numerical simulations. The, the, the analytical solution captured, remember I told you that Paul derived on the basis of his uh, finite difference code, this set of curves. So it looked like a broom, you know, all emanating from one point. With the analytical solution, they all collapsed into one, based on a dimensionless variable there. So that was really the biggest achievement of the analytical solution. Th this was my master's thesis. Then I evaluated it numerically. And um, I, I got my master's, uh, I think, two years after I got there. So you did not really start working on well hydraulics. It was something well, that this involved. Is, this is a, you know, I never worked on well hydraulics per se. People sometimes think of well hydraulics as the hydraulics of what happens in and in the immediate vicinity of the well. But this was a pumping test issue. So design a pumping test that would allow you to establish the vertical diffusivity, it turns out, what this solution gave you, the hydraulic conductivity divided by the specific storage of the aquitard uh, by me making measurements in the aquitard. Now, why would you make the measurements in the aquitard, not in the aquifer? Huntush had a solution so that supposedly could have given you the similar results based on that. The difference was, of course, that the idea of storing gas in the underground means that you a priori search for a very low permeability caprock. So when you conduct a pumping test in a low permeability caprock, even though there's going to be some leakage, you may not be able to see it at all during a standard pumping test. That's why Witherspoon suggested to make the measurements in this very low permeability caprock, because there you eventually would see something if you wait long enough. And so, so this is why this whole idea came up. And we published, uh, th this, is the so this led to the so-called ratio method, which because of my analytical solution is called the newman Witherspoon ratio method, but really the idea, the basic idea came from him. You started with uh, numerical methods also at the time, you have finite elements. Well, it so happened that uh, I didn't do anything numerically other than evaluate my analytical solution, which was trivial. Um, during my master's thesis, but for my PhD, uh, I was searching for a topic. And, uh, you know, being familiar with the Hunter's Jacob leaky aquifer theories and so on, and having just developed this analytical solution, 
I thought that it would be interesting to develop a more general analytical solution for three layers and five layers, pumping from any one of these layers and so on. And I suggested this to Witherspoon. And um, at that point, he didn't have any other specific other topics that he wanted me to work on. So, so this is what I started doing. And I did it in two ways. One was develop an analytical solution for flow to a well in a multi-aquifer systems, much more general than this ratio solution that I developed during my master's thesis. And uh, at that time, the Berkeley civil engineering group, primarily the structural engineers at Berkeley, became very much involved in the development of finite element methods for structural problems, but it was already recognized also that they could be used for flow problems. So there we are was talking about 67, 60. We are talking about 67, 66, 67, 68. Yes. Um, there was a professor Taylor in civil engineering who developed a, uh, a finite element solution for uh, free surface flow seepage, steady state free surface seepage around dams and so on. And Paul Witherspoon was, you know, closely aligned with these people, so he brought finite elements to us. And Iraj Amandel and I together, each one separately, but you know, as a, as a group, started working with finite elements. And so I developed this very early finite element code to test my analytical solution. Which at the time, finite elements was uh, very based on variational principles and yes. all that. It was, so it was very heavily mathematical. Stuff. It was very heavily mathematical. It was, for us, difficult to learn. But once you learned it, you know, you really get excited about it. We got very excited about it. Every, everybody got very excited about finite elements at the time. There was a huge amount of activity about it. Uh, it was completely new to groundwater. Nobody other than us, as far as I know, was developing finite element methods for, for groundwater related problems. Uh, it was certainly not used in petroleum engineering at the time. Later on, it became very popular. You know, people, uh, I think they still rely heavily on finite differences. The people still rely today on finite differences, absolutely. But at that time, you know, you had uh, this, this prospect of uh, having a, a very flexible grid that you could. Uh, you could you could deform to fit uh, complex geologic boundaries and so on, and so it, it was very exciting actually to work jointly both on an analytical and a completely brand new numerical approach. So we we worked on it very hard. We actually we had a, a meeting in 1968 in Tucson where we presented some of the early finite element results. That was the first time we got to Tucson. And at that time, it was already the Department of Hydrology at the University of Arizona? Yes, it was established in uh, 1966 by John Harshberger and some other members or previous members of the U.S. Geological Survey primarily. Uh, John Ferris was am among the uh, people who established this department. So you got to meet Harshberger? Well, I, don't, I didn't necessarily meet them in person, but they were here. They, or they helped organize this, this meeting, or at least attract this meeting to Tucson. I believe that it was a meeting of the International Association of Hydrogeologists, if it existed under that name at that time. But it was an international meeting. So what kept you doing? Uh, I, I believe you also did a solution, uh, developed a method for free surface uh, That came water. later. That came later. So all of this was done as part of my PhD. Um, we, uh, I, I used my analytical solution coupled with the finite element model to revisit the Huntush Jacob and Huntush modified leaky aquifer solutions. We published a paper in which we showed that if you are not very careful on how to use it, you may get some results which are not exactly accurate because there were a few assumptions which uh, we have um, not necessarily included in our solutions. Ours was a little bit more general. And uh, then we also published a paper. Well, actually, that came a little bit later. So after I got my PhD in 68 uh, and stayed in Berkeley for two more years, and I did two things which kind of would help answer your question about you know, this free surf thing and so on. I continued working with finite elements by developing two codes. One for free surface flow at steady state, which was an improvement on Taylor's, because I told you that Professor Taylor in structural engineering actually developed the first code of this kind at Berkeley. There might have been others elsewhere. Um, so there were some problems of convergence, which our code has resolved. 
And then I also developed, this was called FreeSurf 1, and then I developed FreeSurf 2, which um, did the same thing, flow with the free surface under transient conditions. That was in the finite element arena. Um, I did have the help of an excellent, excellent programmer, a, a lady who was actually a professional programmer, who helped me set up these codes. These fin finite element codes are not easy to write. Of course, we didn't start from scratch. We had an elementary code. But with her help, uh, we developed these FreeSurf 1, FreeSurf 2, which I think to this day uh, are, are quite, could be considered models of programming. How you go by not even talking about I it. I still use FreeSurf Some people still use it. But at the same time, um, Witherspoon, Paul Witherspoon, uh, got in contact with um, the Water Resources Department of the State of California and discovered that we could try to apply our ratio method and the leaky aquifer solution that I developed during the, my PhD, perhaps to a problem that they had in Ventura County near the city of Oxnard. Uh, there was a plan to dig a marina into what essentially was an aquitard um, in, in near Ventura, near the city of Ventura there, on the Pacific coast. And the question was, if they eliminate, if they, if they dredge out, dig out a good portion of this aquitard, what would happen to the underlying aquifer called the Oxnard Aquifer, which was a major confined water supply aquifer in the area, primarily for irrigation, but also for domestic supply. Would there be a potential for increased leakage of salt water into this aquifer? Would we be drawing, would the farmers be drawing salt water into their aquifer? So in talking to I don't remember the name of the gentleman from uh, Water Resources Department who talked to Verspoon. Verspoon came up with this idea that, hey, we may have a solution for you. So up came a project where they actually paid for uh, the drilling of piezometers into this unit before, of course, any digging would take place. And uh, trying, first of all, trying out the theory that I developed with my PhD dissertation. Uh, do the responses measured during a pumping test in that system behave like we predicted they would? And could we use the ratio method to calculate the properties of this aquitard? And then maybe based on that, they can decide if they want to continue with the project or not. So this, we, we did this over a period of about two years, between 68 and 70. Um, drilled piezometers at various elevations into an aquitard overlying the Oxnard aquifer, the piezometer into a thinner aquitard underlying the Oxnard aquifer, and also observation wells in the underlying aquifer called the Magoo aquifer, and in the overlying unconfined aquifer, which is called, they called it at the time, the perched aquifer. So we had actually a five-layer system instrumented with quite a few observation wells in the main aquifer as well, which existed there already. So we used existing wells as well as these new wells. By the way, when we were drilling these piezometers into the aquitard, we wanted them to have a screen or an opening contact, hydraulic contact with the aquitard of not more than two feet. And the driller thought we were absolutely crazy. Who is drilling and screening in a, essentially a clay unit? But they did what we asked them to do, because they were, that's what they were paid to do. And then we ran a one month long pumping test. And we repeated it. We, uh, we ran it twice. So two one month long, five layer pumping tests. Probably still among the largest scale, space, and time pumping tests anywhere, also in the meantime, I'm sure there, there, are, there are many other pumping tests that people have run, but it's very uncommon to run such large-scale pumping tests. And uh, we interpreted it, we could, you know, using both standard techniques and the methods that we have proposed that um, actually uh, resulted in a WRR, Water Resources Research Paper, that won Paul Witherspoon and me the uh, Horton Award from uh, the American uh, Geophysical Union, and also the Meinzer Award from the Geological Society of America, because it was really quite an interesting 
piece of work. Um, as a postscript that may interest you and those who are viewing this, this interview, is that just last year, in 2007 I think it was, a student of mine who is now in China working for Schlumberger in, in Beijing, um, her last name is Li, and I, Yangwa Li, I don't think you, you met Yangwa, Yangwa Li, uh, this was her master's. She revisited this three, la uh, this five-layer solution that I have developed during my PhD dissertation. Re-evaluated it using modern techniques of computation, especially new inverse numerical uh, Laplace transform, and reinterpreted the data from the first pumping test, and then used the second pumping test to verify that the parameters that we have evaluated this way were able to predict the second pumping test. So t if today you ask me how to go about it, I would say, well, use these more newer techniques. But um, already at that time, we, you know, we had simpler ways of dealing with this rather complex, but a very interesting hydrogeologic problem. Did you, Did you collaborate and work with um, Al Fries and all the other people there, Nara Seaman? Well, we did not work on the same projects. Uh, Nara Seaman came a little bit later. When I, as I told you, when I came, there were two students, Al Fries, he was already quite advanced in his, uh, in his uh, doctoral work, uh, which, by the way, became very, very well-known piece of work uh, that I'm sure you are somewhat familiar with, he used a finite difference code. I don't know if he wrote it or not, but he used this difference code to investigate the impact of various geologic structures on steady state flow regimes in a basin. Uh, he asked himself the question, you know, what happens if you have one, one layer, two layers, discontinuous layers, and so on. What is going to be, for example, the form of discharge? If I am recharging this system here, where will the discharge take place? Over what length of the downslope area? And so on. He already at that time became interested in interaction with surface water, which he then later continued working on. Uh, and they published three papers on this, if I remember correctly, in Water Resources Research, which became a big thing at the time, because nobody really need, had a clear picture of how geology geologic structure in terms of layers and lessons and so on impacts regional flow. It was a high-powered continuation of conceptual work that started with Joseph Toth. Uh, Joe Toth was the first one who developed a very clear conceptual picture of which way does groundwater flow in a basin? Where does recharge take place? Where does discharge take place? And which way does the water flow through the basin? But he did it analytically, and so he could not build but geologic Tony, I structure. He had done it graphically. More um, he, he, no, actually, there was an, uh, if I remember correctly, there was a mathematical solution with some simplifications. Um, I don't remember exactly, but I think he assumed the water table, he essentially applied over a horizontal water table a mathematical gradient. Okay. Um, and, and then he studied mathematically. I'm almost sure that's what he did, and he, of course, graphed it out developed this very classical picture which inverted by mistake happens to be on the front page of the famous Friesen Cherry textbook. Uh, so th th that, that whole concept of topographically driven groundwater flow through a basin, which I found extremely useful in practice when I actually came later to work in a basin in Israel. Uh, that concept was taken by Al and investigated much more in a much more powerful way using a numerical code where into which he could build these various geologic units and so on. Mm. Which and takes us to Israel. Yeah, and at that time in Berkeley you were not working on partially saturated flow. You were working... I was on not. Uh, I was... I, I, what, what we did do was Al and I, and I think Narasimhan might have been with us, uh, Nari Narasimhan who came from India before I left for Israel. Um, we, were both, we both became very much interested in unsaturated flow through a course we took from 
the late Professor Paul Day, who himself was, I believe, a student of a very famous soil physicist at the University of California in Davis called Lutin. Uh, so Paul had this course in soil physics, and uh, we heard great things about it. We took this course, and that just really fired us up on, on unsaturated flow. This was the first time we heard about John Philip, for example, and his work. And uh, looking at the mathematical complexity of John Phillips's work, which Paul didn't go through, but he kind of familiarized us with in a, in a general way, really made us interested. So when I came to Israel, you started I actually working uh, effectively working on partial saturated flow when you went to, to Israel. After I came to Israel, um, the first thing is that I. By, uh, what, what kind of work did I do in Israel? I was employed as a researcher in an agricultural research organization. It was called the Volcani Institute. It had nothing to do with volcanoes. It was the name of, I guess, the person who established it or whatever. Today it's known as the Agricultural Research Organization. And so it was natural for me to switch into things related to unsaturated flow because this was agriculture based. Okay? That was their main interest. Um, but I also. Um, made contact with Professor Gidon Dagan, who was at that time at the Technion, uh, who together with Professor Dan Zaslavsky, a soil physicist, who later became the Water Commissioner for Israel, uh, had a project, had a research project uh, on unsaturated flow that was more hydrologically based, less, based, less focused on agricultural questions. Yes. Um, and they suggested that I join their project. So I really w had w was kind of working like in two, in two different institutions, though my physically I was at the... But at you, the attacked, you attacked the unsaturated flow problem uh, mainly from a, a numerical standpoint. And I decided since, you know, I've been working with finite elements, uh, it would be interesting to develop a finite element code for saturated and unsaturated flow. And that's the UNSAT code. And that is what developed later into actually known as the UNSAT 2 because there was an UNSAT 1 version that we have never really published in any way. So it developed into an UNSAT 2 code. A little bit of confusion because there was another UNSAT and even an UNSAT 2, I believe, code developed at PNNL, yeah. which was completely different. So, you know, people were at that time sometimes a little bit confused about which is which. But this was the first, to my knowledge, multidimensional finite element saturated, unsaturated code. It took me a year to have it work for reasons, if you want, technical reasons which are of interest, but I'm not sure that this is the, the place to discuss them. And the other thing that I worked so on... You did it by yourself? or I did it completely alone. I, I, I took FreeSurf 1 and I turn, or 2 and I turned it into unsat. So the structure, you know, the code structure was very, very nice to work with, and uh, I benefited from this, from the work of this uh, programmer at Berkeley who helped me develop FreeSurf 1 and FreeSurf 2 in terms of the structure of the code. But of course, every, the equations had to be changed completely and so on, so there was quite a bit of additional work to do. But at the same time, uh, uh, you still went on working with the unconfined flow. I just well, started well, that, I actually. Hmm. I don't know how I get this idea. Uh, but uh, just a second, no, no, let us talk more about UNSAT2, uh, because UNSAT2 was a code, a very successful code, it is yes. still... Uh, actually, actually UNSAT2 became the basis for a code which is widely used today, and that's Hydrus. Hydrus? Developed by Riem van Genukten and his group, and later Jirka Simunek was working on that, I believe, at uh, UC Riverside. Today, uh, Hydrus has also elements of work that Mike Celia at Princeton brought into the picture later, essentially higher order, more accurate ways of solving this equation. So today, it's a more sophisticated code, much more sophisticated than UNSAT2. But originally, it was essentially a modified version of UNSAT2, and they said so in their original you know, write-up for the code. So even though UNSAT 2 is completely uh, out of date by now, uh, the spirit of it lives, I would say, in Hydrus. No, but I, I want to say it because many of these things evolve in ways, uh, like for instance, this uh, leaky aquifer solution you were talking about before. Now they are 
considering no CO2 sequestration. So the same motivation that you originally had for the leaky aquifer of gas injection now is for CO2 sequestration. So they call it again cup rock. Huh? Not I guess they do. So Maybe they do. <laughs> Maybe they but do. But now we have to still try to convince them that measuring drawdown in the cup rock will inform something about the permeability. Well, except except the following. Um, if you talk to people who are actually have recently been doing work in that area, such as Mike Cilia, uh, he's of the opinion that major, the, the, the most difficult leakage problem that has to be faced in the context of CO2 sequestration is not so much the properties of the caprock, but the fact that CO2 would spread over very large areas and there's a very good chance that it would encounter abandoned wells or wells which have not been properly sealed that connect the soil surface or shallow units with the uh, deeper units in which CO2 would be sequestered. And so I was you know, interested to see that he is looking at how abandoned wells would come into the picture. Of course, our approach would not be very helpful in that respect because it would not tell you anything about what, abandoned, what, what such wells would do since you would put your piezometer not in a well, but... Well, but you can use the code. <laughs> to simulate this. Oh, yeah. Of, uh, and um, no, I, I want to, to bring out not just the code development, but also the application. I think that one of the most interesting applications you did in Israel was the work with uh, Fedes and Bressler on the atmospheric boundary condition. Well, uh, what, what happened was that Rainer Fedes, who just two years ago or three years ago retired as head of a uh, unit at uh, the University of Wageningen in the Netherlands, just completed his PhD and uh, he must have heard about my work because he decided to come to Israel and spend a year with me on sabbatical. Um, wait, wait. He had read your paper? I, I don't know what made him interested in our work. He might have heard about my development of Onsat too, I think. You know, I, I really never asked him just exactly what made you come to Israel. But he came for a year and worked with me on building into my finite element onset 2 code a routine that would account for surface phenomena and near surface phenomena such as evaporation, evapotranspiration based on plant uptake. His PhD included both experimental and numerical work on plant uptake of water and how atmospheric conditions uh, change the nature of this uptake with time and how the growth of roots can be built into this. So he had a concept, he had an idea, he even had a finite difference numerical code. So the idea then was for us to join forces and he would help me build into, he didn't know finite elements, so I was the finite element expert, he was the plant expert, and together we built this thing. Um, took us a year. Um, then there we published together with Eschel Bressler and him a number of papers where we looked at potato fields where you have an aquifer pumping below and so on. So you know where we, you could show actually how the plants, together with say pumping in an underlying aquifer in an irrigation ditch, all together interact in changing the water regime. In, in that case, it was a potato field in Holland. But you probably <laughs> are aware that that is, as far as I know, the first rigorous, what they call it now, SWAT, soil water atmosphere transfer schemes. Which probably so, though in our case, the atmosphere only came in as boundary condition. In other words, we did not do any atmospheric calculations. This was purely porous medium and the plant itself, which was modeled very simply, essentially as a, uh, you didn't model individual plants, you modeled the plants in a distributed way. So you had this sink which extended through the root zone. Uh, we talked about the strengths of the sink per unit volume of fluid, okay, not individual roots. And uh, the evaporation and evapotranspiration was handled by using uh, the, at the time, the most sophisticated tools that we had to calculate uh, to calculate 
potential evapotranspiration and taking into account the so-called leaf area index to account for transpiration through the stomata of the plant. But it wasn't really, you know, physiology didn't enter into it. It was a rather crude way of representing Still, the plant. But I'm not sure we have I much better ways of dealing with it today. Well, today they yeah. do it a bit more sophisticated, and of course they couple it with the atmosphere. But, uh, but it is still one of the weak links in this uh, global Absolutely. circulation model, Absolutely. general circulation model. Yeah. But you asked me um, Alberto, yes, about Yankov Fire Flow. About Yankov Fire Flow. flow. That, that was compl done completely separately, in parallel with you all You were of this working stuff. in parallel on the two topics. Completely in parallel. Were Actually, I had a third project, a field project. If you are interested, I can tell you a few words about But uh, yeah, I don't know how I got this idea. Um, I, I was reading Bolton's uh, papers. You know, there was the famous Bolton solution which explained the S-shaped drawdown curve, time drawdown curve that one sometimes gets when he pumps in an aquifer. And it was clear, and one of the interesting things to me in the Bolton approach was that he had a storativity appearing in his model, which is exactly the same storativity that appears in the Thais equation. So the same storativity that allows you to store water under pressure or a extract water by depressurizing a confined aquifer was built into the Bolton model of an unconfined aquifer. And remember, I was working on free surface finite element codes. And so these two things met in the middle. I was also working, of course, on multi-aquifer systems, which are confined. So somehow these two ideas merged. And I said to myself, so I understand something about free surface flow where people ignore the compressibility of the medium. This, the classical free surface approach completely ignores that. Essentially, you get water uh, out of storage by the water table falling, and you get water into storage by the water table rising. But there's no storage underneath the water table by compression of the material or expansion of the material in the water. And on the other hand, Bolton showed that in order to reproduce this observed S-shaped drawdown curve, he needed to build in internal storage. So I said, well, I can perhaps do it rigorously by bringing in a rigorous representation of free surface theory, but rather than writing, as everybody else has done and we have done in free surf, Laplace's equation below the uh, free surface, we would actually use the diffusion equation, the same one that Tice used to develop his famous model, um, into that equation. So I simply combined the two. Um, Essentially, the model was you have an aquifer which has internal storage just like any aquifer. It doesn't matter if there's a water table or not. But then there is a water table, and that's a free surface. Put these two things together. I ignored the unsaturated zone, uh, and I developed a solution which essentially mimicked very nicely the Bolton solution, except that it was entirely based on physical concepts, whether right or wrong, but it, it was physically based. The interesting thing is, my first paper on this appeared in 1972 in Water Resources Research. And when I open the, the paper, the, the, the journal, I see either in front of me or behind me another paper on exactly the same topic by Tatiana Streltsova, who must have left Russia a year or two earlier, was working in Birmingham, England at the time, actually with Professor Bolton. I think. I think it was with Professor Bolton. Uh, yeah, I'm almost sure she was working with Professor Bolton. But this was just her paper, where she came up with a very similar physical idea to mine, but mathematically posed in a different way. So that was very interesting for me to see. And one of the interesting things was that everybody thought uh, that Bolton's model accounts for drainage above the water table, because Bolton actually spoke about drainage above the water table. But in fact, both Strelsova's paper and my paper were able to reproduce that same behavior without accounting for unsaturated flow. So there was no need, in order to reproduce this, there was no need to account for unsaturated flow. Today we know better. We now have a brand new solution developed, uh, published just last year by one of my master's students, also a Russian. I was also thinking about that because you started uh, with the unconfined flow in Israel uh, and then it, it somehow 
Well, like everything you have done, I mean, you started and you never left any topic. So I mean, things have their, <laughs> their own life. Where what, what has happened, of course, there is my solution for flow to a well in an unconfined aquifer, because it mimicked the data so well and was physically based, became rather popular. And I was actually thought it was controversial at the beginning. Well, I'll tell you about it. It, it was embedded. It was embedded in some of the very modern software for pumping test analysis, such as Actosolve and others. But it remained very controversial. And especially uh, some of our colleagues at Waterloo were very critical of it, because they did some rather sophisticated pumping test and in instrumentation um, of uh, both the unsaturated zone and the saturated zone in their pumping test. And they were arguing, and rightly so, that you know things are happening in the unsaturated zone. How can you possibly neglect the unsaturated zone? New one solution is no good. Well, even earlier than that, weren't there some problems with the meaning of compressibility with uh, Gambolati and with Ismael Yes, but that was kind of secondary because the compressibility does play a role in generating the first rising gleam of the drawdown curve, but that is a very short-term process, minutes, and you can easily not even see it sometimes. So yes, there was an argument, but the much bigger argument that uh, I think to this day actually permeates the literature is how important is the unsaturated zone in this context. So uh, the uh, Waterloo group, uh, there was a PhD student there uh, by the name of Nuvonkor, who did his work with Bob Gillum. And they very strongly felt that uh, you know, one absolutely has to build in the unsaturated zone into the model. So. Uh, I, when, when Guzel Tartakovsky, this master student of mine, came into the picture and was looking for a topic, I said, well, you know, we still have this open question about the role of unsaturated flow. And she was a mathematician. She came out of the School of Applied Mathematics at the Kazan University, one of the best universities in what used to be the Soviet Union. Um, how about looking at this and trying to develop a solution? And she did. We published it last year. And uh, we revisited a pumping test that the US Geological Survey, Alan Munch, and some of his colleagues have run at uh, Cape Cod. Mm -hmm. And we're able to analyze with our solution that pumping test very nicely, very beautiful fits. There are some assumptions behind this. Uh, one of the assumptions is that the unsaturated zone can be characterized by a single variable, which we call kappa. That's, of course, a gross oversimplification. So we have just now submitted, last week in fact, another paper to Water Resources Research with another PhD student of mine by the name of Fulendra Kumar Mishra, in which we took this kappa and showed how to translate it into the, the parameters of well-established models of unsaturated soil properties uh, such as the von genuchten Mualem model, the Brooks and Corey model, and the uh, gardner russo model. And we also modeled the same pumping test numerically using a uh, code developed at Pacific Northwest Laboratory called STOMP. Uh, we, es we, we estimated the parameters of this aquifer and the unsaturated zone using an inverse call, which is very widely used today, called PEST, coupled with this simulation called STOMP. And we compared the two approaches. And we think that there is a way to, in fact, use pumping tests to characterize both, you know, to, 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 to decide what is the proper characteristic curve. Is it the Van Genuchten? Is it the Brooks and Corey? Is it something else to be used? and to, to, to estimate the parameters of these curves. You can do it numerically. But we were also successful in doing it based on our analytical solution. So today we have an analytical solution which is more general than the one that I developed at that, that time. Developed them. I yeah. see. I see. But uh, at the same time, you also became interested in uh, inverse modeling. Well, actually, I became an in interested in inverse modeling when I was still in Berkeley. And it's an interesting story of how I became interested in inverse methods. Of course, I was doing numerical forward modeling with finite elements. And Paul Verspoon had very good ties with various international groups, with the Russians, with the French, I don't know who else. 
He spoke many languages, two, two sentences in, in almost every language of the world. So one day he brings in this group from France, from the School of Mines in Paris, which is actually there's a major school in Paris, but the research group that we were associated with eventually was sitting at, in Fontainebleau. He brings in Guillain de Marcilly, whom many people in the field know because, among others, he has a well-known textbook. Um, are, this is about 1970, 61? No, this must have been 1968, 69, when I was still working on the Oxnard project. Guillain came, in fact, I don't remember who else came. It might have been his co collaborator, M. Salem, because they, were, they, they just published a paper on inverse method. The authors were M. Salem and de Marcilly. And they were describing to us this and geostatistics. This is how we became interested both in geostatistics and in inverse methods. Because that group, uh, the, the, uh, the Paris School of Mines, of course, were, other than Kolmogorov in Russia, were the, essentially the inventors of, of geostatistics. And, uh, and of course, Krieg in, in South Africa. But in terms of modern geostatistics, Mataron at the, at the School of Mines in Fontainebleau was the key person and geologist and uh, mining people and groundwater people in his milieu all started working on geostatistical methods and they also worked on inverse methods. So the two were actually coupled right from the beginning, at least in terms of who was dealing with them. And I was fascinated by what they did with this MSLM and the Marsili approach. So that kind of sparked my interest in inverse method and kind of an initial interest in geostatistics, which developed a little bit later when I actually spent some time in Paris with these people in, in Fontainebleau. You were mentioning another project that you were working in Israel. on in Israel? Yes, uh, the other project was actually, uh, it's interesting, you know, I had some, people know primarily of my theoretical work or, or computational work and so on, because that's what you normally publish in the literature that most of us read. But um, throughout my career, I had some large-scale field project. And one of them is the Oxnard project, which of course people do, those who follow this literature know about. But the other one was an investigation of uh, flow condition in the Hula Valley in northern Israel, which had to do with a situation in which northern Israel, uh, the Jordan River, if you follow it from its three sources, which are a little bit to the, f to the north of Israel or within Israel proper, depending on you know, which political view you want to take about okay. wh where the boundary runs exactly, um, forms a valley called the Hula Valley just north of Lake Kinneret on which Jesus walked, the Lake of Galilee, which is a major source of water for the country. It's actually the point at which water is being pumped into the Israeli water system, which was being developed in the 60s, which made me interested in groundwork. So anyway, this Hula Valley was essentially marshes, wild marshes at the beginning of the century, of the, of the 20th century. And um, in the, I don't remember the exact years, but the early years of the 20th century were years of intensive drainage of the Hula marshes and development of agricultural lands there crisscrossed with irrigation and drainage ditches, all of which connect down through the Jordan River to Lake Kinneret. Through years, and, and, and the marshes, of course, have peat soil in them. So you have this relatively thick peat soil, and then you have clay underneath and all kinds of other things. There's a basalt aquifer underneath, surrounded by the Galilee Mountains on one hand and, and the Golan Heights on the other side. Unfortunately, everybody knows where this is today for because of politics and wars and so on. So there's this, this valley, which is now a heavily agricultural place, uh, including fish ponds, which used to be a marsh. And you have this, this whole drainage and irrigation thing. And so what happened is that people started noticing that the water in Lake Kinneret is became, becoming gradually eutrophied. Uh, phosphates and nitrates were accumulating in Lake Kinneret and there was a real fear that during one of the inversions of the lake, which occur uh, every year, um, that perhaps the algae that were being 
that we're feeding on, on these nutrients would spread throughout the entire lake for enough of time to literally kill off all the life in, in the lake. And uh, the question was, how do these nutrients get to Lake Kinneret? Clearly, they came in part through the Jordan River, but what is the subsurface element of all of this? So we were asked to investigate this by the Israeli Department of Agriculture. And um, I was uh, one of the key persons on, on this project. And what we did was essentially established two piezometric and tensiometer and other type of instrumentation networks. One network that covered the entire basin, so you know, kind of extended over kilometers. You actually designed the location. We designed and drilled across the entire area and we went down to 15 meters. I had a terrible battle with agricultural engineers who were kind of 15 meters, who were, who were arguing with us that 15 meters is a waste of money and we should only go down to about a meter or two at most because I told them I'm interested in seeing what the, what the overall system is going to be. 15 meters was not enough. But that was the maximum that we could go because of, <laughs> yeah. And then we also instrumented in a similar way a single plot between four irrigation ditches to a much shallower depth. So we got, you know, like a two scale, two scale systems. And the first thing before, I, before we even started doing this, what helped us design the system was the conceptual framework that Joe Toes developed and that Alan Fries with Viruspoon continued, and that is, what do you expect happening in a system such as this? So you have a valley being drained by the Jordan River, surrounded by mountains on all three sides, except for the south side, where is this Lake Kinneret. And the prevalent concept, which people to this day argue, some people in Israel argue is the, is, is the controlling concept, is that nutrients from uh, decomposing peat get into the ditches, get down, and travel through the underground into Lake Kinneret. Actually, it's interesting because there is literally a bedrock dam just north of the river. It's all basalt, which in my opinion would prevent this from happening in any case. But you see, because of Tos and, and, and Al and, and that work, my conceptual framework was precisely the opposite. You have recharge taking place in the mountains. You have streamlines going down and upwelling into the valley. So I was expecting water to come from below, mix with water from the ditches which comes from the upper reaches of the Jordan River, mix in the shallow soils, and then travel through the ditches and through the Jordan River to death. And I did not expect much groundwater flow to take place into the Lake Canary. Actually, the fact that you had marshes there sort of suggests that your mother... Yes. Of course. I consider this to be essentially obvious. But it's interesting how you know, people's conceptual framework could be so different. And I encountered that later with others as well in this country. Uh, it was ingrained. Your know, groundwater flows downward. OK? And so, so we did uh, piezometric studies. We, we, did, uh, we measured, of course, you know, permeabilities and so on. Did a lot of Hovorslev tests to establish, uh, like slug tests, to establish hundreds of them there. Um, we did uh, isotopic studies with the help of uh, some isotope experts in Israel. They had a very, very strong uh, laboratory at the Weizmann Institute, the isotope laboratory there. Uh, Yoel Gatt was a key person uh, in there, and uh, there were some others. So they helped us uh, do uh, stable isotope studies, you know, oxygen, O18, and uh, deuterium, and so on. We did tritium studies. And in my opinion, it became absolutely clear that this concept prevails, that that's exactly what is happening. We published two papers in the Journal of Hydrology about that, which, by the way, just very recently, Gambolatti and his group were quoting, and I think some other people to this day were quoting, uh, because we did both laboratory work, where we took samples of peat and other things to the laboratory, even my co-investigator, Shmuel Dasberg, who is now retired from the Agricultural Research Organization, uh, did all kinds of laboratory experiments on them, established their unsaturated properties and so on. And then we did these large-scale studies. So it was quite an interesting project. 